This is a compilation of my research into anti-gravity propulsion. I've looked at countless examples and claims to anti-gravity, but have only found one that fits the bill. Let's start with the fact that millions of saucer-shaped UFOs have been spotted. Flying disks are the most commonly seen shape of UFO. Since a disk shape is not very aerodynamic, there must be some other reason for why it is shaped this way. There is an ancient Indian text I have, which is called the Vimanaka Shastra, or Aeronautical Science, which talks about strange beings called Vimanas, or astronauts, that crashed in the Himalayas sometime before 400 BC, and taught the people how to build machines. One such machine is a craft that flies on rotating liquid metal. Legends of the Nazi Bell experiment, as told by Yakov Sporenberg, also refer to a technology that rotated a mercury-like substance that was violet in color and glowed when under test. We also find several examples of modern scientific researchers who have reported strange gravitational effects with rotating superconductors. The first and most famous was conducted by Russian scientist Eugene Podklitnov at a superconductor research laboratory in Finland where he found evidence of artificially produced gravitomagnetic fields that were trillions of orders of magnitude larger than predicted by quantum mechanics. The effect appears to be directly related to Bose-Einstein condensation, which is where you cool something down to the point where all of the atoms in a substance reduce to a single wave function and behave as a single atom. I'm not going to get into the intricacies of quantum mechanical behavior, but basically this produces two observable effects, known as superconductivity and superfluidity. Just as a superconductor conducts electricity with zero resistance, a superfluid flows with zero resistance. That means zero viscosity, zero friction. I go over this in brief detail in my other video, but keep in mind that condensed matter physics is in itself an entire discipline of solid state physics, which is only half the physics you need to know to truly understand anti-gravity. The other half is space-time manifolds and relativity. Modern gravity research has reached a hiatus, which has happened several times throughout the history of theoretical physics, where we have no other choice but to sit back and wait for the mathematicians to develop new mathematics or the experimental physicists to find new results. And hopefully the insight that I provide in this video will help speed this whole process along. This is my drawing of the superfluid anti-gravity centrifuge. It's basically a hollow container which is filled with a special liquid which is both a ferrofluid or magnetic fluid and a superfluid which flows with zero resistance. The idea is to use magnetic fields to accelerate the fluid in the container, getting it to spin around faster and faster. Because there is absolutely no friction, it will keep going faster and never slow down. Once the fluid approaches relativistic speeds, it could theoretically warp the space-time continuum around the craft, producing a so-called anti-gravity effect. Now, the most important thing is this fluid, what it is and how to make it. Unfortunately, I don't know the exact formula, so it's going to require a little bit of alchemical tinkering and experimenting for us to come up with the exact formula. Fortunately, we have some information on the ingredients and properties of the fluid, thanks to those who were brave enough to come forward with the information. Edgar Fouché, who claims to have worked at Area 51 on the Aurora Project, describes the inner workings of the TR-3B flying triangle, and says that there is a central accelerator ring that rotates a mercury-based plasma, supercooled to 150 Kelvin, pressurized to 200,000 atmospheres, and rotated at 60,000 revolutions per minute. The supercooling supports the theory that Bose-Einstein condensation is taking place, and the mercury-based plasma gives us another clue. Please note that there are two scientific definitions of the word plasma. It can mean a fluid suspension of solid particles, such as a blood plasma, or it can refer to the fourth state or ionized gas phase of matter, which is the other type of plasma. Lance Corporal Jonathan Wagen of the Disclosure Project describes the fluid he saw all over the ground at a crash site in Peru as a dense, viscous, silvery fluid that when you looked at it would change color from green to purple. This is another clue because in order to make duplicolor paint, which is the kind that changes color depending on how you look at it, they grind up shiny metal into tiny flakes and then mix it in with the paint. Iron will actually float in mercury because the density of mercury is higher than that of iron. This makes it possible to suspend trillions of tiny ferromagnetic iron particles inside the mercury, creating a ferrofluid plasma. However, mercury freezes solid at 234 Kelvin with one atmosphere of pressure. Even mercury thallium alloy, which is used in special ultra-cold thermometers, will freeze at 212 Kelvin. 
So unless we have some sort of antifreeze component, the whole thing is going to freeze solid long before we can cool it down to 150 Kelvin under 200,000 atmospheres of pressure, as Edgar Fouché says we need to. Furthermore, the superfluid state has only been observed in the millikelvin range, and there is no reason to believe that mercury would become anything but a frozen block of solid metal at these temperatures. We just don't know until we get some people working on it and doing the experiments. As of 2006, the highest temperature superconductor at ambient pressure was mercury, thallium, barium, calcium, copper oxide at 138 Kelvin, possibly 164 Kelvin under high pressure. This may provide us with an alternative solution by using superconducting particles suspended in the fluid. Because they contain thallium and barium, it is possible that they could function as our antifreeze, as both of these elements can be added to mercury to lower its freezing point. Again, I'm just throwing ideas out here as to what this fluid may be and how to produce it, and I encourage you to share your own thoughts, and I highly support further scientific research into this area, especially the search for a high-temperature superfluid, or possibly a superferrofluid, if such a thing even exists. It would certainly make our problems a bit easier. Most of these questions are going to need to be answered with actual experiments and a lot of trial and error. Liquid nitrogen boils at 77 Kelvin and can be purchased and transported relatively cheap. Any experiments requiring temperatures below 77 Kelvin must be done at a super expensive cryogenic lab, another thing to keep in mind. The first step is to build or buy a pre-manufactured container to rotate this fluid inside of. A large hollow aluminum donut would probably work the best. Regardless of the material you use or how you build it, the important thing is that it's perfectly round and smooth on the inside. I would build mine out of quasi-crystals and have a trillion nano-refrigeration units built around the inside of the ring where the heat could gravitate towards. The outside would be reinforced in order to contain the massive centripetal forces. Then comes the magnetic drive system. You should know that iron is attracted to magnets and that coils of wire create electromagnets when you run current through them. So in order to get the fluid to circle around in one direction and gain momentum, you need to have a couple separate coils which turn, and, which turn on and off at specific time intervals. You can look up Tesla's electrical motor patents for some ideas, but I would also try using the Rodin coiling. Marco Rodin is a pretty far out guy with no formal training in mathematics who has nonetheless found some rather interesting geometrical consequences of number theory, one of which happens to be an electrical coiling which is remarkably strong. But I would stick with a basic experimental setup before you go all out on this. Start with the fluid. It's the most important piece of the puzzle. The container and the electrical wiring is stage two. Then stage three is the actual experiment where you set the container in a bath of liquid nitrogen and hook it up to a scale to measure the change in weight as the fluid begins to rotate. There's my experiment. <laughs> all you skeptics out there, the only way to debunk it is to actually build it and do it. Remember that the force increases exponentially with the radius of the container, so if you make it too small, you're not going to observe a very significant anti-gravity effect. So you want to make it big so, you're going to get a, so you can get a big, a big enough force to be actually be able to read something out. NASA's Advanced Propulsion Labs did a video where they tried to disprove this effect, and to do this they used a tiny little rotating superconductor disk and showed that it produced a tiny, barely measurable effect. They then concluded that the effect was too small and weak to be used in any serious propulsion drive. And this, of course, was pure deception on the part of these lying government bastards at NASA who have cooperated with the secret government to keep all this technology and the truth about aliens covered up for decades. I'll go more into why and how they did this in a separate video. It basically has to do with the fact that this type of propulsion would be noiseless and emissionless. So combine that with meta-invisibility and just think about what the implications are for stealth technology. Please try to keep the discussion in this video focused on how to build an anti-gravity engine. Hopefully we can get some intelligent debate going on this mercury-based plasma as that is the key component of the whole experimental setup. Please feel free to share any additional information you think people might find helpful to actually build this and do this experiment. I'd really like to see people posting video responses and showing me their own experiments, research, and progress. The whole reason I started researching this is because I've always wanted to build a flying saucer. Hopefully, thanks to the research of dedicated people like us, we can actually make this dream a reality. Where there's a will, there's a way, right? Thanks for watching.